Good evening. My name is Joel Russ, and I'm pleased to be host of this evening's very important uh, public program. Over the years, the community of Cape Elizabeth has approached public decision making in the most thoughtful, careful, and inclusive manner. The community has made intelligent decisions about what is best for our town and all of our citizens. The examples are all around us. The renovation and expansion of the public library, Fort Williams Park, the museum at Portland Head, and the Public Works Garage and Public Safety Buildings. We've also been a community that's been well served by our volunteers, our elected and appointed representatives who represent our collective interests. We've consistently paid, placed our trust in these people and have not been disappointed. We have confidence in those who represent us. Cape Elizabeth now has another significant public decision to make, whether or not to approve an $11.7 million bond issue to improve through a combination of renovation, reuse, and new construction our Pond Cove and middle schools. Tonight, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth will have an opportunity to directly question those who have been most directly involved in the planning of this important community project a project which began in November three years ago. I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists tonight, each of whom uh, will have an opportunity to make some opening comments about their respective roles uh, in this process. To my far right is Connie Goldman, our superintendent of schools. Next to me is the chair of the building committee, Paul LaLiberty. To my immediate left, is the chair of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, Ann Chapman. To her left is Deb Cross, a fifth grade teacher in the Cape Elizabeth School System. And to her left, Paul Stevens, representing the project architect, Stevens, Morton, Rose, and Thompson. The format for tonight's meeting, which we hope will be a combination of information from our panelists and a response to the questions which you may have, uh, is to keep it informal, and as informative as possible. We'll ask Connie, Paul, Anne, and Deb to make some brief uh, opening comments. We hope this will give those of you who haven't had an opportunity to tour the schools or to read any of the information that's been made available uh, on this issue um, an opportunity to learn about it perhaps for the first time. Uh, we'll then entertain questions from the viewing audience your questions will be passed to me. I will repeat the question uh, for the appropriate uh, panelist. Uh, we'll try to answer every question you have, but we won't duplicate questions. I'm told that this program, which is obviously live tonight, will be repeated several times between now and the day of the referendum, which is November 2nd. I'd like to thank you all in advance for your interest in this program and your active participation through your questions. Uh, but before I turn it over to uh, Paula Liberty to start, uh, I'd like to share my own personal thoughts about this issue. Uh, I am not an objective moderator uh, of this program tonight, and I think you ought to know that. Uh, I'm very supportive of the upcoming uh, bond issue for a number of reasons. Uh, I attended uh, every grade of uh, uh, the schools uh, in this school system beginning in the first grade at the old uh, Cottage Farm School uh, and graduated in 1962. I think I was well served by the education uh, in this community. I also have two sons, both of whom have graduated from Cape Elizabeth and both of whom were also extremely well served by this educational system in which all of us take a great deal of pride. And finally, I think uh, as a parent whose children have graduated, it's my continuing obligation to support the education of future generations. Also, I think we as a community have an obligation to provide our fair share for regional educational excellence. And to the extent, the extent that we're successful and each community around us is successful, we'll have a higher quality of life and a higher educational system for the citizens of all of Greater Portland. So it's for those reasons 
uh, that I uh, support this uh, bond issue. Uh, and I'm also very satisfied by the uh, exceptional work that's been done over the last three years by many, many people. Uh, let me now turn it over to Paula Liberty, who will uh, begin our presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And hopefully we can answer all of your questions tonight. <clears throat> the building committee was formed uh, in November of 92. Uh, our committee basically uh, followed <clears throat> the report from the Cape Elizabeth School Space uh, Study Committee, which uh, evaluated the, it was the original uh, committee that evaluated the needs of both the elementary and the middle schools. Our committee uh, was formed by the town council. Uh, we quickly evaluated the buildings and decided that an architectural team should be uh, on board to assist uh, in the planning of this project. Uh, we went through a detailed analysis, uh, interviewed many architects, requested uh, proposals, uh, and selected the team of Stevens, Morton, and Rose. Once Stevens, Morton, and Rose was on board, uh, we formulated our mission statement. We had no preconceived notions uh, except that we knew something had to be done. Uh, we proceeded to detail our goals and objectives. We wanted uh, a facility that would support and enhance our educational programs. We wanted a facility that would provide balance, that would have a, a well-rounded educational uh, system encompassing uh, athletics as well as the educational programs. Uh, we wanted a facility that would anticipate the future so that it would be able to be flexible and serve the community well for the next 20 years. We wanted a design that was economical, that was basic, and that would serve this community well. <clears throat> we wanted flexibility in our plan so that uh, the, the elementary program and the middle school program could function uh, and be very flexible. Uh, we wanted to solve the health and safety issues uh, that were obvious as far as air quality, uh, as far as the handicap accessibility, uh, and we wanted our system to be a cost-effective uh, plan. We feel that through a process of being systematic, uh, we have, in fact, presented the community with a comprehensive uh, plan that solves all of our uh, problems and meets the objectives that we established. <clears throat> I'd like now to turn it back over to Joel. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, Connie. I'll pick it up um, with some comments on the themes uh, for this project. Uh, you're gonna hear these over and over again in various ways, so I'll just try to get them out there uh, as a starter. Sometimes people will say to me in the course of this project, uh, well, education doesn't depend on a building, and we are a, uh, community that has a good school system, I mean, really, uh, this just is not a big issue. I really think it's extremely important for people to understand that buildings are a necessary but not sufficient condition, and that uh, there is nothing to be gained by having a building that is so non-user friendly, if that's one way of thinking about it, I guess, um, that every morning you don't know whether it's going to be cold or hot or too cold or too hot and those kinds of issues, and we're going to be talking more about some of those. Uh, I think the building is sort of the starter, and there is no reason why we should have all kinds of distractions while we are having a good program, and I think the program will suffer if we do not uh, solve some of these problems. The overriding theme here is safety. These buildings are not falling down around our ears yet, but some pieces of them will. Some pieces, as a matter of fact, have. We have, um, Deb's probably gonna share with us a few 
teacher incidents or teacher stories, and we've been trying to explain some of this. Um, there are things now that are just old, worn out, unable to continue, and uh, that things like, as you mentioned, Paul, air quality is a real safety factor as well as some of the other kinds of things um, that are just plain not working for us. There's another major piece, though, for the taxpayer of the community, whether you have children in school or not, and that's good management. Um, I sometimes have to look at this as a businesswoman. I'm running a $9 million business. We are spending right now $200,000 in um, emergency repairs, excess energy costs. Uh, we're paying our debt service is $216,000, which is almost totally uh, the result of band-aiding some roofs, some handicap access issues, which you are going to have to do both of those things substantially over. Uh, and those are, that's $400,000 right now in th this year's budget that is essentially going down the tubes. Uh, I don't think that's good business. And I don't think that as we look down the future, we want to continue having money go like that. I mentioned uh, the, the user-friendly uh, situation. We have teachers who, whose room may vary anywhere from 46, 47 degrees in the morning to 85. Sometimes the same room, depending on whether it's in an area where the sun streams in in the, uh, in the warmer months as well as uh, on an exposed area and the wind whistles through window walls and so on. Uh, I was talking to a group of sixth graders last week and they were talking, recalling having been in a testing situation where a teacher opened a window, one of the older portions of the building, but she couldn't close it and it got stuck. They were in the middle of a test and, and they, they were just very uncomfortable. I mean, it was a, it was a considerable distraction. The, these kinds of incidents, when you talk to groups of children who have been in the building or even older youngsters who are in high school, they come out with all kinds of those daily uh, interruptions. And the last thing I want to say as a, um, as a theme is the idea of looking to the future. Uh, some of us were at a meeting today at, at uh, the University of Southern Maine uh, inviting us to consider joining um, one of the extensive computer networks that we would be linked up not only through the university, but literally throughout the country, other resources. It's hard for me to get terribly excited about that when we're dealing with these two buildings anyway, with situations where some teachers have to unplug something before they can plug in the computer. Uh, there are impacts on the curriculum and our science program virtually taught in waterless rooms in the K or all the grades one through uh, eight. And uh, the computer programs are only two examples of scholastic programs that are being impacted. I agree that the building process, the committee process, the school space study process has been very thorough. Uh, I do believe firmly that the situation has been researched and I applaud everybody who has tried to plow on through. Thank you. Thanks, Connie. Um, for those of you who may uh, wish to look at information that has been developed over the years, um, it's contained in a series of reports that began back in 1990. Uh, and uh, if you're not persuaded by at least the volume uh, of work that has gone into this, you might be persuaded by the, the uh, quality of the content if you were to uh, uh, take a look at some of the material that's been uh, presented. Uh, Ann. Um, I'm just going to keep my comments very brief because time is marching on and, and we want to answer some of the questions um, that we've got here. But I would just like to point out that I'm, I'm chairman of the school board now, but this is really the issue that propelled me into public service. I was a member of the School Space Study Committee and that's what really got me interested in, in serving on the school board. Um, and I, I have to admit that when I first went into the middle school, I had uh, very young children at that time. I was shocked, really, at the quality of, of facilities we were providing for our kids at the middle school level. And as I spent more time in Pond Cove and wasn't any more comfortable about that, um, it was you know, a real eye-opener to work on these two committees, the School Space Study Committee and the Building Committee, um, just to, it, it's amazing how much you can learn about uh, you know the facilities, the structures, and, and all that, and it's and it's it's just amazing to me that people aren't more upset about this issue. Um, even people who 
who have learned quite a bit about it don't seem to be very excited about it. And all I can think back to is, is uh, 1990 when we had our roofing crisis um, and you know people were up in arms about that and if anything the buildings are really um, in worse shape now not because we haven't been trying to keep them together but because the aging process is marching on. Um, so I hope people will take the opportunity to read these reports. Uh, please call in your questions if you have any questions about uh, what the process is or um, you know whether this is the right plan or not because we certainly will try to answer your questions. Thanks, Ann. Um, the final uh, speaker tonight is one who probably has more direct knowledge of the condition of the schools than uh, uh, Deb Cross as, as a teacher and uh, knows the uh, problems that both she as a teacher and her students experience and has agreed to come and share with us some of, uh, some of those day-to-day -day, uh, issues. Thank you, Joel. Um, I, I have been a teacher uh, at, in the 1930s portion of the middle school for nine years. And I think the overwhelming thing that I can say to you is that everything bad that you have heard about the schools, they are that bad and in fact they are worse. Um, I am very concerned about the condition of the schools. I'm a taxpayer and a resident of Cape Elizabeth. I'm also the parent of two preschool children. And I am extremely concerned about the learning environment and also the safety of the schools. To give you a, a really good example of just how much the temperatures can fluctuate in a sixth grade classroom last year. Uh, Steve Conley came in on a Monday morning and his aquarium was frozen. So we're not talking about just being a little bit uncomfortable and maybe being in the low 60s. We're talking about a classroom that is freezing and where kids had gloves on for several days until they could fix that problem. Um, there's a classroom right above me where every winter, and I don't expect it to be much different this winter, on one side of the classroom the kids are in their coats because of the air coming in through the window walls or through the, and through the windows, and on the other side of the classroom where they're near the heater, the kids are in t-shirts and they're, you know, saying, can we open more windows, or can we open a window, I should say. The safety f f um, issue to me is overwhelming. An issue that, um, or an event, incident that happened uh, seven years ago in Bruce Lynn's classroom, which again is right above me in the 1930s building, an entire 15 foot, 15 to 18 foot fluorescent light bank came crashing down, the entire thing, 15 feet of these heavy metal fluorescent light bank. No reason at all, no expectation that this was going to happen. Um, fortunately, it came crashing down in a portion of the room where Mr. Lind was, was, uh, did not have students at the time. Had it come down 10 to 15 minutes later, there would have been uh, five to eight students working there in a reading group. And I, I just, when I think of the weight and the sharp edges of these old kind of fluorescent lights with those fins, metal fins, if you could imagine that, um, it is very frightening. And that, that isn't an issue where you can say, well, it was geez, it was poorly maintained. And no one had any idea that something like this would occur. And I have an entire pad here of little stories of what it's like to be in the middle school. Um, so I just, um, you know, I can repeat as someone who works there every day, as someone who is a is a taxpayer and someone who has children coming up uh, into the schools, uh, I just can't emphasize enough in what poor condition these buildings are in. Thanks. Thanks, Deb. Um, this is a terrific opportunity for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth to ask the questions they have uh, with this assembled group, and I would encourage you to, to call if you have a question. Uh, we've received several, but for those of you who might not be able to read the number uh, in front of us, it's 799 0881, and we would enjoy uh, hearing your questions. Um, the first question uh, has to do with the projected cost and effect on the tax rate, uh, and the question is, will the increase in taxes, uh, which have been estimated at $332.01 um, per year, uh, continue for the full 20 years? Uh, and uh, a related question, what is the tax increase on the average household? I think that is the, average. Is the average. And yeah. will it continue for 20 years? The payment is a 20, it is a 20 year bond, and so the payment does in fact continue, but not at that rate. Uh, the, when you are dealing with state construction for public buildings, there is a regulation that the principal uh, is constant all the way through, 20 payments on principal and that the interest, however, it, the first payment, or the, actually because the first one probably is interest only, it would peak payment would be the second payment, that is the highest. That's at uh, 
that uh, 330 uh, figure for the average household. From then on, it goes down. As a matter of fact, we have a table that we've worked out just to show the relative uh, way in which that works, and it's part of a display that should be up in the library tomorrow afternoon. It's almost done, and I want to give a great deal of thanks to Mary Gale, a resident of Cape Elizabeth, who has done a super job of putting that together. And we, what we have tried to do is anticipate questions like that and, as much as possible, um, produce charts or something that's fairly easy to grasp. Thanks, Connie. Uh, as many of you uh, may already know, there have been a number of tours of the middle school, and uh, there are two more tours uh, that will be conducted prior to the uh, vote on November 2nd, uh, and those are Saturday, October 23rd, and Saturday, October 30th. Uh, both begin at 10 o'clock. And uh, for those of you who haven't had the chance to do that, it's a real uh, um, uh, educational experience in itself. Um, Question number two is, how will the science facilities in the middle school be improved if the referendum goes forward? Um, I think a uh, related question is, what are the current science, <laughs> uh, the condition of the science facilities currently? <laughs> well, maybe, Deb, you can explain what, what, from your point of view, what they are. Well, that's pretty easy to answer with the current conditions. There are none. Mm. There, are, there are no sinks in the classrooms. Uh, teachers go through unbelievable gyrations, for lack of a better word, to um, try to provide science experiments and do um, science in the classroom. <clears throat> and it is my understanding with the new plan um, that there will be uh, one or two science labs per grade level. So there will be two classrooms out of each seven that will have um, access to, I believe, a common um, science lab. And just if I may add on to that, I, I have a it's kind of related to technology. Um, most classrooms have just one outlet in them. And in that one outlet, we have uh, a computer and any other AV equipment that we run. Um, so it's pretty hard to have a fairly up-to-date and um, you know, doing some good technology in your classroom with one outlet and a lot of extension ports. For instance, one of the things that we would hope to do uh, uh, through construction, it's almost impossible for us to rewire those buildings or even, I mean, it's just impossible to even start with a coherent plan. Uh, because of the size of the buildings and so on. So clearly rewiring, um, probably uh, hiring a consultant to make sure that we get good advice on what the state of the art, well, maybe not state of art, but at least a, a good substantial use of computers down the next 10 years so that we not only have the uh, wiring and the machinery or whatever it might take, but we also uh, can use that as an opportunity and part of the budget of this project is movable furnishing, which would include a variety of issues like that. Can I just add one thing about that? We should also mention that there is a science room planned for the elementary school, one room for uh, one through four, which is, you know, at, at, that, at that age, the kids are so interested in science and the facilities are so poor right now, the classrooms are crammed. And I'll, I'll never forget last year we were doing a um, doing terrariums and, and things like that with a second grade class and the amount of mess that's created and disruption of the regular classroom to, to try to do a fairly simple experiment um, you know, with, without facilities to clean up or even leave the terrariums um, is, is really something. So, so that's another needed feature, not just in the middle school but in elementary school. Thank you. Uh, the qu third question is, how will the traffic pattern be improved over the present if the referendum should succeed? One of the major concerns that the building committee had was the safety issue with the site pa traffic patterns. Uh, as you are all aware, uh, currently school bus drop-off, parent drop-off, and any children running from school to school uh, all occur in the same area. Uh, we decided that the best solution would be to separate bus traffic and car drop-off traffic uh, and also attempt to provide access to all of the fields uh, where there was no crossover uh, over traffic areas. Uh, we feel we accomplished that by having <clears throat> bus traffic uh, drop off uh, via Jordan, coming in on Jordan Way to a circle at the new entrance which is on the southern side uh, towards the high school, uh, and that access is out uh, f 
from that area uh, through the high school. <clears throat> the car drop-off traffic is off of Scott Dyer Road, uh, is the main entrance uh, to the new uh, facility. Uh, again, uh, on the front, if we had a diagram up, we probably could explain that a little better. Ultimately, the plan does separate the bus traffic. You're going to be able to pick this up. The bus traffic, bus drop off is in this location. Uh, this is Jordan Way. The high school is located here. Scott Dyer Road with the new entrance for car drop off uh, in this area. Uh, children can access the fields through a walkway uh, that has no crossover uh, onto paved area on, on traffic area. Uh, the courtyard between the two schools, which is currently now uh, roads, <coughs> will be a, a uh, courtyard, a uh, grassed area uh, for the children to uh, be able to use. I think we should also emphasize that that is bus only on Jordan Way. Uh, I've had some questions about that, so I want to make just, I know you said that, but just we emphasize it a little bit. Separation so, of yeah, car right, and bus uh, traffic. Um, I don't know if anyone here is prepared to answer this question. Uh, it almost sounds like a uh, um, town council decision as opposed to a school board decision, but I'll ask it because we said we'd ask all the questions. Um, if we're not clear about a head tax, uh, then perhaps the, uh, the caller could uh, call in and, and tell us what uh, he or she has in mind. But um, the observation is that interest rates are down, but so are dividends, and the caller is suggesting a head tax. And what is um, our response, or your response? <laughs> well, my question would be exactly what is meant by a head tax. I, I'm aware that in some states, and I don't know of any in Maine where uh, financing for schooling is um, in various ways concentrated on either a surcharge on parents whose children are actually attending school, something of that sort, but I am not clear enough on what was intended there to be okay. able to answer that. We'll try to answer it with the time remaining if, if that caller could give us a little bit more guidance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can we expect energy costs to go down with the proposed renovations? Paul. There's no question that we, that we can expect energy costs to go down. First of all, uh, we're dealing with equipment that I think in some cases is as old uh, as 40 years uh, plus uh, with the attendant maintenance uh, problems that uh, have already been discussed. Uh, plus the fact that I believe that most of the glazing in all the school buildings is single glazing, uh, as well as the fact that most of the curtain walls are, are relatively uninsulated. Uh, these buildings were built back in the 1950s and, and early 60s when people were not at all concerned about oil costs, uh, and there's no question that the energy costs will go down considerably. Um, that, uh, some of those comments, Paul, uh, suggest uh, another issue, uh, and that is, um, or a question perhaps, and that is, uh, w what was the nature of the, of the building that occurred in the, in the 50s and 60s? We built a lot, we built quickly, we built, mm -hmm. we built relatively inexpensively, uh, I guess deciding to put money into programs instead of buildings, and, and why, did all that, uh, why did all that happen during that period? Well, we, we're putting out a supplement in the Courier that will be out Friday, and there are some very good charts that sort of call people's attention by grouping the numbers of buildings and when they were being built. Obviously, it was a baby boom. There was a need for quick building, um, and I think those rectangular, single wall, curtain wall, whatever you call them, the buildings are sort of, uh, I think of them as sort of the prefabs of that day. I mean, they, they did the business and we've gotten our money's worth. 181,000 to build lunch school in 62. Um, we can't complain that we haven't gotten any, any value out of that, but it's time to rebuild for the future, as our little slogan says. Thank you. Um, what is the likelihood that problems will continue? Um, pardon me? Portables. I'm sorry portables will continue to have feasible life left uh, in structures. In other words, 
the portable structures that exist, uh, are they going, what is their suggested useful life or real useful life? That's what that question says. Um, there are really a couple of answers, and I, I can give an overview, but I, I would like to ask Dan Reed, who is our maintenance director, to give you an example of what we're running into with the portable. It is the oldest, that is, it's, I guess, in its fifth year. Dan, would you share with the group a little bit about how portable or how permanent or how sturdy that portable is turning out to be? Uh, three weeks ago, a group of second graders, impatient, waiting at the door, pushed their foot through the floor. Three-quarter inch plywood completely rotted through, a hole large enough to put an adult foot. Uh, at that time, we simply put a Band-Aid on the top, screwed it on, trying to laminate a surface area so we can provide egress traffic through the fire exit that this door is at. Uh, the situation worsened. Uh, another hole appeared. Uh, Friday, as we entered the area, we cut out a portion of the plywood floor. Uh, all of the 2 by 10s which are the floor joists, were completely rotten. I have a piece of uh, this material right here, and I can show you. This is exactly what the building is like. It is a wood frame structure. The only structure it has is wood framing. The wood framing on one side, which is a load-bearing wall, is completely rotten from the sill, all the joists, all the plywood, back four feet. The only thing that's holding the building up is T111 and a box truss formation and interior 5H sheetrock, which is crushing. The building is collapsing even now as we speak. A simple snow load is going to reduce its elevation probably by another quarter of an inch. Uh, the building will continue to fall down until it's replaced. This is an advanced state of disrepair. This section of one portable. Thank you. The, while you're there, Dan, um, this is sort of one of the more extreme symptoms of an accelerating crisis situation. Uh, perhaps you, uh, while you're standing there, why don't you mention again the heat problem we're having in Pond Cove that you were dealing with last week also. Uh, the heat problem is much like the structure of the uh, temporary classroom. It's old, it's brittle, and as the pieces uh, one by one fall apart, uh, then it is necessary to go further. Uh, we had a situation where a circulator pump went down, therefore there was no heat. Uh, it's, uh, it's fortunate that we replaced the other circulator pump last year in an emergency, much like this when there was no heat. Uh, when an attempt was made to replace simply the motor. Uh, that model is no longer made, and the connector that was available would not hold the packing seal so that uh, we couldn't stop the leak. So we went to the next step and tried to replace the entire circulator, uh, which required uh, valving off large gate valves to isolate this area of the heating system so that the work could be performed. The gate valves are such an advanced state of deterioration that we were not able to shut the valves off and during an attempt to do the repair work, uh, there was a lot of water coming out, too much to do the work, so now it's going to be necessary to shut down a larger portion of the building for an extended period of time and drain the system in order to replace what is essentially a very small piece of equipment. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. I, I yeah. think it is important to mention, though, that those portables were truly supposed to be <coughs> temporary buildings, and there are no, they don't have running water, or, you know, they're not, they weren't intended to be long-term solutions to our problem, and that we, in this town, we chose to attach them to the buildings to make them more aesthetically pleasing, but that does not make them any more permanent construction. I think that answers this next question, mm. which is, what is the likelihood and I'm adding a few words that I think were left out. What is the likelihood that the portables will remain in place? Uh, everything I've heard suggests that they, they will can't. not. They can't. Um, does the uh, town already have um, a lot of school-related uh, indebtedness? Our um, debt service right now is 216000 uh, which is the lowest debt service in the entire area. Uh, we have a little chart on that one, too, which we hope people will look at both in the supplement and in the library display, give you some idea. For instance, Scarborough's is 19% of their budget. Um, and 
the that is strictly almost totally uh, a result of the roofing which was not a totally successful project and some of the things that were done at that time uh, this is not a question that's been asked but I, I think it might be worth asking now um, there's been a uh, litany of problems that have been described with the existing buildings and the question that might be asked is uh, what is the likelihood that um, or how can the community be assured that these problems won't exist in a newly renovated and new construct, newly constructed building in the future? Well, I think that's a, a very fair question. Um, the board and I have been involved uh, for three years in analyzing, reorganizing, and um, really putting in place a, an effective maintenance, custodial, and to the degree that it's involved also transportation system. That is the entire support system uh, is something that has taken a great deal of our time and attention. Not only was it a money drainer, but frankly I thought it was dysfunctional. Uh, it wasn't obvious to anybody from the teachers to the principals to myself and to other people who were trying to, to cope with the situation that we were, we appeared to be acting like we were Maytag uh, salesman sitting there waiting for the phone to ring. I couldn't find any pattern of preventive maintenance. I couldn't find any pattern of understanding uh, what you did at certain times and so on. We have really gotten our, a handle on that issue. I don't want to go into excessive detail, but I'd be happy to refer people to, uh, if they want to come in and visit me, look at what's going on, talk to Dan. Um, Sue Weatherby has been a great aid in doing all of this. Anybody knows Sue knows she's an organizational wizard, so that's another piece of the puzzle. A related question which you may want to deal with uh, uh, individually um, is who's responsible for the terrible maintenance of the buildings. And I, it sounds like a historical problem uh, and one that you may or may want, not want to address today. I, I don't well, um, I don't want to duck anything. I think that I believe one of the things that, that we've tried to use, some of the principles we've tried to use in addressing this problem are those that are commonly called total quality. And total quality makes the point over and over again that it really isn't the person, it's a system. And that what my responsibility has been is to figure out, along with all the people I work with, how do we make a better system so that people can come to work and do the job that they're supposed to be doing. And there just wasn't any system. My own view is that schools uh, often get treated rather casually uh, in custodial maintenance situations. It's a part of the budget that is competing, frankly, with educational dollars uh, program, and it's hard sometimes for people to spend money on those things. Uh, clearly, it is very important for us to have good maintenance programs, and I'm, I'm really very proud of the people that have been involved with this. Uh, who's to blame? I don't believe in that that's, that's not an issue I really want to uh, try to pin down, but I, I will certainly accept the, the fact that we had to rebuild the system. Connie, if I can just say something on that. Um, certainly there have been some maintenance questions in the past about the maintenance of the schools, but I think an issue here that, that isn't being said is that the construction of the Lunt building and some of the, the Pond Cove structure and certainly all the additions that were put on the 1930s building were very poor to begin with, and as you said, kind of a prefab um, type of construction and that even if they had the best maintenance plan in the world that I think after 30 years that um, m much of this was bound to happen anyway. I, I think I can add that, that typically construction uh, and particularly mechanical, mechanical and electrical systems aren't designed to last much more than 20 or 25 years and, and we're, we're dealing with, with schools that have gone far beyond that useful life so I think in, in many cases it's a miracle that some of the stuff is still functioning even with the very best of maintenance. So it's certainly you can't lay all of the problem at that door by any means. Thank you, Paul. Um, this may be a question for you too, Paul, given your um, experience in other similar projects. Uh, what, how does the cost of this project compare with other area building projects? And I assume they mean uh, other area uh, school building projects. Yeah, I, I think it, it compares very favorably, and uh, a couple a couple of comparisons. I also have a chart here we can we can use, although I don't think you can see it very well on uh, on the screen. Uh, but we're looking at costs in the neighborhood of fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars per student uh, in both the Yarmouth Middle School that was recently completed uh, and in the upcoming Scarborough 
uh, middle school, whereas the cost per dollar or, or cost per student uh, in Cape Elizabeth to renovate the schools and, and basically taking advantage of the resource that the buildings do provide knocks that cost down to around, I think it's around $9,000 uh, a student uh, in Cape Elizabeth. So uh, yes, the buildings are in bad shape, but also yes, you are getting an extraordinarily good deal uh, by being able to use what you have. If you, were, if you were forced to go build a new building, that's what you'd be talking uh, is $16,000 a student instead of nine. Uh, if the facilities are so dangerous, why hasn't the state closed down the school? Well, what we are doing, frankly, every incident that occurs, we immediately do something to address the problem. And uh, for instance, the typical thing that's been going on with the air quality control, we spot check various issues, and they come back sometimes with a distinct problem that we can cure. Sometimes it's a problem that isn't uh, over the danger limit, but is indicating that it's something brewing. Most of what uh, we can, in fact, uh, the, the fire marshal, a local fire chief, is very rigorously going through the buildings. There have been a couple of things he said he would close us down if we didn't get a handle on storage of open papers, in, uh, particularly in the elementary and, and some other issues, and we simply respond to these. Uh, that's part of the $200,000 of emergency repairs it is going on. When we had a light fall down in a Pond Cove classroom a couple of weeks ago, I asked Dan to do whatever it took to get all the remaining old brittle plastic covers off to put sleeves on the fluorescent light tubes so that we, that particular thing can't happen again. Um, but what I do feel uncomfortable about is I don't know when and where the next accident is going to occur. I mean, it's just unpredictable. I mean, they, as everybody is saying, the buildings are worn out uh, with associated problems. I think the, the worst problem I can foresee right now that I know about is this dysfunctional heat. What's going to happen if the whole thing kind of blows up or a whole major section blows up in January? I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, question number 11. <laughs> um, why do we need another, ca another cafeteria? Well, on the 26th, we have a meeting that we are inviting the public to that's going to be held in that cafeteria. I hope that whoever has any questions about that will come to that meeting. Um, that, that section is, uh, well, let's, uh, I think the teacher should talk about that section. You eat <coughs> lunch there or go with your students. And I, I can add a comment in here, and that's the same cafeteria that I ate lunch in when I attended the Cape Elizabeth schools, and I graduated in 1955. <laughs> All I can say, the, the middle school cafeteria is a very um, dark and moldy and uh, unpleasant place with um, chipped kind of plaster that falls down and um, it sort of has a little smell to it. And if you were ever to go in there in the summer, they have these humidifiers, dehumidifiers running because of the mold that grows up the walls. Um, I don't think it sends a real good message to the children. We, we had a meeting with the fifth grade students today to talk to them about their behavior in the cafeteria <coughs> and on the playground, and I, I couldn't help but think about the environment that we were asking them to eat in. And when we're asking them to respect um, the rules of the cafeteria and to make sure they push in their chairs and pick up trash and um, that kind of thing, um, that that environment really doesn't say that that's real important to us. So it just is a very, old, unpleasant environment. Just, just to clarify to people, this, it's the basement of the building. Something. I mean, when you go in there, they're just little windows up around the edges, and um, it, it really is quite an appalling lump to if I have might kids add eating to that, lunch. If I might add to that, uh, the elementary uh, cafeteria is being shared right now with the uh, gymnasium. Uh, it functions as a dual purpose, and one of the main considerations when we uh, certainly connected the two buildings was to try to optimize the usage of various functions uh, where it could be shared by both elementary and middle school in order to keep the operational cost down. One of the uh, glaring areas that that could be very well accomplished was the kitchen area where we have one kitchen serving both middle and elementary school. Uh, it, met, it relocated, solved the problems, uh, with the middle school taking that cafeteria out of the basement uh, and it also helped uh, resolve the problem with the elementary school 
uh, as far as having the shared space so that now we, we combine the cafeteria uh, so that they are separate during classroom time uh, but we have the added advantage of opening uh, that particular space up for uh, auditorium type space as well uh, and it has the shared uh, kitchen function. Uh, the other spaces are just reused for other purposes and uh, it really does solve all of the issues for both cafeterias. I just Thanks, wanted Mark. to uh, emphasize that that is a wonderful addition to community space. We have a lot of groups use, uh, I don't think, I can't ever remember anybody asking to use the middle school cafeteria. But they do use the Pond Cove All Purpose Room, as you said. Um, again, sometimes uh, inappropriately as far as the columns that get in the way, but there are many groups that do use that. This idea of having a space that would hold 600 people, and the only other space we have in the system that would hold a large group is the high school cafeteria, and that's booked all the time. It's very hard to get. Uh, this would also add the capacity for our K-8 program to have uh, the kinds of assemblies. Uh, we have some very talented uh, uh, youngsters who uh, in, in interested teachers in doing assembly programs of one kind or another and we're very, very, we almost have no elementary program because of lack of any kind of amenities for them. I think that's an important uh, point if I could offer an opinion as a, as a moderator and that is that uh, an analogous project uh, in Cape Elizabeth to this with respect to the community space is uh, what occurred when the Thomas Memorial Library was under consideration for expansion. And uh, there were lots of plans that were suggested from demolition of the old building, new construction, uh, to doing nothing. Uh, and it seemed to be a rather simple, ultimately rather simple solution which combined uh, renovation of two buildings important to the community historically, uh, that is the old elementary school and the Thomas Memorial Library, with an effective new construction in between. And what I think convinced this community that that was a worthwhile project was not just, be, just a that it was just a library project, but it became a larger community facility and has been used in that way many times. And uh, if this community has a center, it is out here with its co combination of school and other public buildings. Uh, that's a, I think that's an important consideration. Um, this is a, uh, a question that uh, we hoped would be answered, uh, asked. Uh, um, if the referendum fails, um, I guess really there are two questions. Um, what are the immediate emergency repairs that would have to be made and at what estimated cost? The larger question is, what do we do as a school, as a community, in providing appropriate middle school and Pond, school, Pond Cove school facilities uh, if it fails? What are some of the alternatives that you as superintendent of schools have been obviously thinking about? Well, I don't see any good alternatives. Um, when people ask me, well, why don't you just patch it up and so on, I have actually tried to get some idea of what fixing the heating system. You've got to re remember, both of those buildings are tied together. And much of it is steam, some of it, a small part of it is hot water. Steam heat is cheap to put in, but expensive to maintain as I understand it. And if, when it goes, you've got an awful lot of stuff to replace. And now, Paul, you're a, you know, in the business, I mean, you sort of know how, uh, how long, but my understanding from people I've talked to, if that heat really, that kind of little piece of symptom of the problem that Dan was sharing with us earlier, that's it telling me we could be facing meltdown. We could be, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but it, all the reports say it's at the end of its useful life. And if we've got over 500 children in one building or if we have some problem with both of them, what do we do? We have to then rent portable generators, I mean uh, heating units of one kind? We'd have to rent or uh, find a temporary, additional temporary space in order to uh, house the students. Uh, what's happening with the systems as they keep breaking down, it will become, uh, it's at the, the point now that uh, you just can't keep uh, replacing those uh, or repairing those uh, different functions. Uh, it needs major overhaul. Uh, major overhaul will, t will take time. One analysis that, that we did in comparing, and, and I think it enters into it, uh, is the 
looking at strictly renovating the buildings and saying let's address only those issues, not even a band-aid approach as uh, on a crisis type situation, but strictly look at renovating what we have and replace the portables and do nothing else. Uh, looking at that scenario, uh, we were talking a project of around nine million. Right. Uh, and when we start looking at those type of dollars, it does not address any issues uh, regarding programming, uh, regarding, regarding traffic, regarding the safety. Uh, it still lacks solving the serious problems that we have as a comprehensive type plan. Uh, so when we start looking at the overall plan, uh, actually our proposed project, which combines the renovation and addition, is a, is a middle of the road rather than just replace everything we have at what Paul had, uh, Stevens had uh, indicated was around uh, 16 or 18 million uh, to replace that facility, the facilities that we have, we're looking at an in-between type approach that solves all of our problems. And we can't keep going on too much longer or the crises situations will not be only 10,000 or 20,000, they'll be a, a much larger we'll be bonding another million. I mean, one of the things that, as I listen to this and try to imagine what, what this means, you can't fix the heating, given the extensive nature of it, without disrupting the window walls. And if you're disrupting the window walls, you might as well fix them, because some of them are going to kind of self-destruct as you're pushing around dealing with the, with the other. As soon as you cut into any of the tile or the transite behind the pipes, you've got into asbestos, you're going to get again into a, an abatement program. All of this implies that you have to get, uh, you know, some kind of empty space to work with, which means the kids have to go to school somewhere else. And believe me, there isn't any place. I mean, maybe we could rent St. Bart's. I don't know how many <laughs> Excuse me, I've never talked to, to them about this at all. I mean, I'm just saying maybe, you know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I have thought about this because occasionally something, you know, dramatic happens and happened uh, to, I happens to other school systems. There is no simple solution. Things are connected, interconnected, and it's going to be uh, disruptive to the program. We might as well do it in a planned, orderly, and cohesive fashion. That's what this program is. This hasn't been a program, um, in, in my judgment, that has been precipitated by one event or one um, uh, physical problem within the within the facility that it's been an accumulation of, of problems over a period of time they're multiple uh, and uh, there's not one simple solution to what ails the school buildings um, and I've just written down the list that has come out of here and uh, one caller has suggested that that uh, uh, scare tactics uh, are being used to, to motivate uh, uh, voters uh, I hope that it's that it's not uh, a scare tactic, but that it's a realistic uh, presentation of the very uh, serious problems that we face in this in these school buildings. Uh, there are real safety uh, and health problems. Uh, there are handicapped access problems. Uh, there are asbestos disposal problems. There are traffic uh, and access problems. Uh, and when those all add up. Um, uh, one may characterize it as, as, as scary, yes, I'm sure that it is scary, <laughs> but to uh, suggest that they're scare tactics I think is not uh, appropriate. Um, uh, the caller did want some response. I gave him my own <laughs> response, but does anybody else have a well, you know, I, uh, I think I, a might, I might add a little bit to there that. As, as someone who's familiar with a lot of other school buildings in the state of Maine and also familiar with a lot of school buildings that were built about this point in time and that what Cape Elizabeth faces is not unique. Uh, and it's not just school buildings. Uh, I know of many hospital buildings that were built in response to the baby boom uh, back in the 50s, and they're all facing the same kinds of problems with buildings that were built uh, for $11, $12 a square foot uh, back in uh, 1960 uh, and who are 10 years past their useful life. So it's, it's not just Cape Elizabeth that's, uh, that's facing that problem. Can, you, can, I, yeah, can I just say something, too? Um, you know, as a school board member, I really feel that public officials have an obligation to bring to the public what they know. And this, this problem has been studied in depth for three years, and everything we're saying is backed up in those reports. This is not something that we're making out of, uh, you know, whole cloth in order to, you know, build some monument to bureaucracy or something like that. They, you know, we are suggesting this plan because 
our kids' safety is at risk in these buildings, and it's also not economically responsible to keep <laughs> trying to run the buildings the way they are. So it's not, it's not scare tactics. Connie. Uh, I really think that um, anybody who has given a thoughtful look at some of the things around, oh, I hope that question was asked facetiously, um, but if it wasn't and if people think we're exaggerating, um, all I, I mean, <laughs> people sitting in the classrooms, uh, there are things that happen, we haven't uh, exaggerated anything. Um, obviously, we would not allow children uh, and teachers to use that space if we weren't reasonably certain that it, it met reasonable standards of daily use. What this is trying to emphasize is that it's going to cost us more and more and unpredictably more and more to keep that space minimally safe. And that I would think that prudent planning and good repairs and uh, this kind of the moment has, hap has come together for a variety of reasons when the major renovation plan makes a lot of sense. That's simply good planning. It would avoid wasting money. It would also avoid the, uh, the nuisance to perhaps more than nuisance level. It goes on daily. And we're talking about major systems. Um, we're also talking about protecting the investment that the town has in these buildings. So. I don't regard that as scare tactics. I'm sorry if people might take that. We just try and tell the truth. Um, I think we have, I have two more questions. Uh, there may be a time for one or two additional questions if you care to call it in. Um, um, I might just try to get some sense from the producers uh, just how much time we do have. We'll take a quick pause. <laughs> We'll go about another, another several minutes, uh, and we'll conclude when we think it's appropriate to conclude. How's that? <laughs> um, there was a survey that was uh, conducted, uh, I think in part by school students uh, in late September, which in itself was a very interesting educational uh, uh, process for them, I'm sure. Uh, and the caller would like to know what the results of that survey showed. They, uh, the youngsters asked three questions. Have you heard of the referendum? Uh, about 75% of the people called uh, had, and I should say that we completed 350 calls, uh, and they were, the calls were put together from using a random uh, uh, table, number table, uh, and using the telephone numbers of Cape Elizabeth, uh, and that was a good, that's a good uh, completion record for the numbers of uh, Cape numbers, Some redundancy there. So 75% about a month ago had heard of the referendum. Then they asked the question, uh, if you have heard of it, have you made up your mind to vote yes, no, or undecided? About 8% at that time said no, perhaps a um, slightly smaller percentage, but in that neighborhood. And the rest were evenly divided between yes and undecided. Then the youngsters also asked, a, uh, do you have some comments or questions to, that we could pass along to the building committee? and the uh, people working on information. The questions have been very steady. That is, a, the kinds of questions asked here tonight were pretty much what we got uh, through that process. Uh, people kept saying they wanted more information. I do have to say that I've been a little surprised that um, I think I've done five tours, and I realize that's a pretty heavy commitment of time, two hours on a Saturday morning. People are very busy. but. Um, I think we've seen a total of 75 people on those five tours. So if people really do want more information, uh, I want to call your attention the supplement going with a courier. Uh, there will be a direct mail piece. There is going to be the display in the library. Uh, and there is a meeting on the 26th. So I certainly hope that people will take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, thanks, Connie. Um, we may, if the calls keep coming in, continue for another 10 minutes or so. Um, uh, if not, we'll, we'll conclude. Um, what is the difference uh, in the cost of the new construction versus the rehabilitation of the D section and the portables? And the D section is that area of the school that is um, adjacent to the um, school bus parking garage, which is adjacent to Holman baseball field. It's at that end of the, of the uh, school complex. I had the figure, but would you like to explain oh, that? The figure is three. It's, 
the demolition, the difference between uh, replacing the classroom space that's in D Wing um, and, uh, and fixing up the building to code is $340,000. Uh, perhaps Paul would like to explain one of the reasons why that the committee went with that decision. The, the $340,000 is about 4% of the total construction cost and in planning the facility, that wing in addition to being in extremely poor shape and, and difficult to reutilize because of the configuration of the building and all the handicapped accessibility problems that we have in that building, it's very remote from the rest of the, uh, from the, rest of the classroom space in the building and it was nearly impossible to arrange any kind of a cohesive middle school plan to support a middle school, school curriculum with the renovation of that building and it was a, a and we looked at a lot of alternatives to try and use that building but it was a committee judgment that it was good money to spend uh, that extra four percent uh, to enhance the the educational planning and the educational program in the schools uh, i don't believe there are any cost estimates uh, specifically put together uh, to retain the to repair and retain the portables as uh, I think everyone, and I think as, as, as Dan uh, certainly demonstrated a little earlier, everybody realizes that those are definitely at the end of their useful life and that's not an option. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, there, have been, there have been a lot of, uh, uh, a number of articles, in fact there was a series of articles uh, uh, in the local newspaper uh, surrounding the entire uh, school funding formula and school funding issue um, in the state of Maine. Um, so a common question uh, that I've heard is why isn't the town of Cape Elizabeth receiving any support from the state for this particular project when we look around our neighboring communities and see, uh, and see uh, varying percentages of state support for similar projects? Mm -hmm. Well, there are two reasons. And the major reason is that the baby boomlet created an, um, a real pressure on space needs in the, really throughout the state, but certainly particularly in Cumberland County. It's very obvious in New York and Cumberland County. Uh, those districts that you're seeing receiving aid, for instance, uh, or receiving state construction aid, uh, without exception, as far as I know, uh, have had youngsters out in portables, sometimes as many as 30, uh, and the state does give some help towards funding those portables and obviously they took a look at the millions they were spending on uh, the lease portable program and they that's where the heaviest points came for giving state aid for construction. However, you only get a chance to apply once a year for each of the there are two branches but for a major project once a year. We did apply. We were 36 on a list of 56. Um, they funded four. Um, what kills us is that we have on paper the square footage because they include the high school. We have maxed out the use of the, of the high school by putting the kindergarten there, but that's exactly what we would have had to do. Um, further, I also want to point out that we get $2 million of our $9.5 million budget. $2 million of that is state subsidy. And there was an article in the paper about Falmouth. Falmouth doesn't get any subsidy at all. Uh, they get some reimbursement on, uh, on transportation and special education. We get $2 million of our $9.5 million budget. That's because we don't have business in this town to speak of. Our, our businesses are very small. Falmouth, of course, uh, it, and other communities around have been growing. So I think the, uh, the other thing that is a factor in that is once you have a series of state-approved projects, Scarborough, for instance, has had a series of state-approved projects. They get at 19% of their budget for debt service. They qualify to, they've long since broken the circuit breaker, and so that uh, building that they're contemplating is in fact uh, state paid. But we had 2% of our budget, and that was not a state approved project. It wasn't a building project. It was, it was uh, repairs, and you get no, no credit. I mean, we're starting at base zero, so we're, we're stuck between a couple of issues. I think maybe, if you're looking about strategy, maybe seven or eight years ago, if we had refused to use the cafeteria, had refused to use the third floor on the uh, old building, refused to use a few other spaces, and it filled up the esplanade with portables, we might be fairly competitive for state funding too. But those weren't things that were what, you know, what people wanted to do, I suppose. Anyway, they didn't happen, and we're not competitive. These may be the final uh, two questions. Um, 
should the cost be shared equally, and I assume that means per capita, as opposed to basing each resident's obligations on just property values. And it's possible that that is an explanation of a head tax. Could be. <laughs> you want to try that again? Oh, can I? I lost track of when you. <laughs> Should the cost money. be shared equally uh, or just be based on property value? Well, this is basically looking at various funding formulas. Obviously, the state has been wrestling with this for, I guess, years now. Uh, there may well be some way in which the state decides to look at those funding formulas. But I do want to emphasize to this town that the current formula is giving us two million of our nine million. Uh, Yarmouth gets no state subsidy, Falmouth gets no state subsidy, and other towns around here get uh, less than we do. We get almost 30 percent. And if the valuation continues to stabilize or, or go down, the present formula will yield more for us. Uh, so I'm not as excited about changing that formula until or unless I see that it really would improve our finances. Uh, and I'm not sure that, that uh, from a state point of view, exactly how that's going to play out. If this is talking about local property tax and that uh, there is some other way of assessing local property tax, there may well be other ways of doing that. Obviously, that's a town council issue and not a school board issue. We don't get to set the budget. We do, of course, have to draw up one. Uh, one caller uh, asked about the fairness of uh, tax increases for those on fixed incomes, uh, uh, particularly for those who don't have children in the school system. Um, I'd like to give my own response to that, and, and uh, I guess I suggested something at the beginning of the program um, that motivated me in part to support this bond issue, and that is uh, a society's continuing obligation to uh, be interested in and concerned with the education of its children. Uh, and that's not an obligation, uh, in my judgment, that ends uh, when our children uh, graduate from high school. Uh, we're residents of the community and we have a continuing obligation to provide that opportunity. And if this community of Cape Elizabeth is, is recognized for anything, it's the excellence and quality of, of, of its educational system. It's why many of us uh, moved here in the first place. It's why many of us stay here. Uh, and uh, uh, that would be my answer to that, to that question. Uh, it, of course, may be difficult, particularly for those on fixed income. Um, uh, I don't know how one solves that problem, uh, but it's a continuing obligation of, of this community and every community, and uh, uh, I think we need to uh, simply address that responsibility. Are there any other observations on that issue or not? That was very well put. Um, I think this essentially concludes um, our program for tonight. Uh, I think a lot of information has been shared by all of the panelists. Uh, I hope that those who have watched the program uh, learned as much as they could. Uh, if you didn't uh, and are still unpersuaded by um, the information that you've heard, uh, I would encourage you to seek out any one of the panelists individually uh, for their perspective and for their information. Take advantage of the opportunities that exist between now and November 2nd to learn as much as you can, whether or not you have children in the school system because this is a community decision and not just a parental uh, decision. Um, and encourage you to, um, most importantly, go to the polls on November 2nd uh, and cast your vote. Um, does anybody here, would anybody here like to have one last opportunity to, to say anything before we conclude? Just thank you for coming and moderating and, sure. and for Lending us your support. Connie Goldman, thank you very much. Paula Liberty, Chair of the Building Committee. Ann Chapman, Chair of the uh, School Board. Um, Deb Cross, fifth grade teacher. And Paul Stevens, who is the Chief Architect for the uh, Project Architect. Thank you all for being with us tonight. <laughs>